Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. They preached a new faith for a skeptical age, and it spread faster than any religion in history. Tonight, we continue our series with the story of their communist manifesto. Communism is a religion. It is anti-Christian, it is vitriclade, it is immoral. <clears throat> I'll say so that all American people can hear that the only enemy of peace in the world is communism. Today in 1848, a ghost is haunting Europe's states, and all their rulers vow to do an exorcism from this fate. To slander your opponent as possessed by it is common wisdom, striking fear and growing strong that monster's name is communism. Therefore, two things are true. To powers, it's a power too. But since they've become boogeymen, the communists must state their views. So all of us have gathered, here in London, where we take a stand and offer to the world the book that's in your hand. All history of humans is a fighting between classes. The free man fights the slave, the rulers fight the masses. Sometimes the fight is hidden, sometimes it's bright and loud, and reconstructs society or burns it to the ground. Social ranks exist in every history we've unearthed. Patricians, knights, and plebeians, feudal lords and serfs. Today we have our classes too, but possibly the very last, the ruling bourgeoisie and exploited proletariat. It started in economies of old medieval towns, expanded by the global trade to places newly found. The Asias and Americas were where the merchants had to be, and so the town based industry gave way to little factories new expanding markets put a strain on even those and so the revolutionary big machines arose with every railroad drew the power of this ruling class thus bourgeoisie emerged from changes in our recent past when born it was oppressed and hated by the feudal lords it stood its ground and fought its enemies with bows and swords it grew and formed republics or allied with sovereign kings and over time it took their place and now rules everything and so you see the bourgeoisie are revolutionaries their enemies the lords and kings have long been dead and buried they did away with higher Hierarchy based in mere convention Appealing to self-interest They achieved their grand ascension They killed our gods and morals And our sense of social worth And provided free exchange-based exploitation to the earth They said of doctors, priests, and poets I will now destroy these And the bourgeoisie then waved its hand And made them its employees They took our sense of sacred family values And reduced them to a financial agreement So that it could better use them The bourgeoisie have far outdone The lazy kings and queens They've built the greatest monoliths The world has ever seen The pyramids and aqueducts And churches look pathetic When compared to modern buildings That's where we must give them credit. The kings of old required things to be unchanged and orderly. New machines and social systems threatened their authority. The bourgeoisie obtains its power only through disruption. So everything that's sacred is consumed by its corruption. All that is solid melts into air. All that is wholly profane. The people are stripped of culture and must face their lives of pain. We're living through an age of fundamental economic transformation. Technology has changed the way we live and the way the world does business. Bourgeoisie has spread its net until the nations all are in its grasp. And in this sense, it's very cosmopolitan, in fact. Reactionaries fear it for this reason. It undermines traditions and conventions they believe in. And with its access to the world's treasures all enlisted, it produced commodities we didn't even know existed. It took national secrets and it gave them to the masses. It took old sacred knowledge and it let us all have access. Now anyone can read philosophy or wise orations. And every starving peasant is brought into civilization. Its bottom barrel prices deal the blow in every scrimmage. And day by day, it reaches creates the world in its image. And the image was mesmerizing. A picture of a world where old boundaries are disappearing. A world where communication, connection, and competition can come from anywhere. of rural towns on cities it has now brought forth and also dependence of poorer countries on the global north. It centralized production, property, and population and imposed a single code of law and system of taxation. The power of this uniformity has been impressive. You can build the modern world if you've money and invest it. But if the bourgeoisie emerged when feudal systems fell apart, then if the markets prove unstable, maybe something else will start. The monster bourgeoisie have conjured up is hard to tame. The boom and bust results in problems that sound insane. Production grinds and halts and every working man gets screwed because they just produce too much and 
different markets are pursued one day there will be no more untapped markets to exploit and the people will be bitter when the markets reach that point every dollar earned by owners leads the working class to grow the people who can only live as long as they can sell their soul the worker merely fills a slot within a broader situation doing very simple tasks or overseeing automation less fulfilling work will also pay the worker less and with every new machine the greater load put on each worker's chest once we're little workshops with some condescending bosses have become expansive labor camps and this is what the cost is both men and women now must work both children and their parents in the landlord's shops and bankers take each paycheck and they share it and the mom and pop shops and the lower middle class can't compete with bigger business and become relics of the past the deep rumblings that we hear today the rumbling of discontent is the thunder of disinherited masses rising from dungeons of oppression It appears to have a stage development At birth begins this hatred of the bourgeoisie envelopment but Instead of targeting the owners, big machines are smashed And wares are burned because they think this will restore the past They also are a mass of disconnected laborers The only time they organize is when the bourgeoisie concurs So the bourgeoisie directs this anger toward their benefit To make the monarchy and petty bourgeoisie irrelevant The second stage occurs when workers start to grow in numbers They start to unionize and form agreements with each other They might revolt and mostly fail but even so the union grows Means of organizing are improved with roads and phones at times the union falls apart and workers fight each other but at times it comes back stronger and the owners must seek cover they'll concede with legislation you can have your workers rights now come join me in my battle with elites and help me fight against conservatives and bourgeoisie from countries that we hate but bourgeoisie recruiting them in politics just seals its fate as lower level wealthy kids fall into destitution they bring new educated ideas to the revolution and when the fight is heated there are bourgeoisie that fight their pride and realize their time has neared its end and join the other side classes that exist the proletariat alone desires revolution all the others fight for what they own small business owners artisans and peasants have a cause but it's just to keep things as they are or take back what they lost the people who have lost their jobs and live in tents or parents basements can be shown the goal of proletariat and help to chase it lack of education and reluctance to take action makes them easy targets to be bribed and swayed by other factions the true proletarian is fully disillusioned he's destitute and ready for a different solution he can't afford to keep a family or raise his children he doesn't love his country and he doesn't have religion and if he wishes to improve his life and escape poverty he must destroy the way in which society views property revolutions tend to be fought by a small minority but proletarians will battle as a great majority within each nation one by one they'll overthrow the ruling class but this will be a different revolution from those in the past serfs obtained the commune and the merchants corporations but modern workers to improve must learn cooperation when the bourgeoisie push workers into so much poverty that they can't afford a place to live or just a pot of tea the owners should grow wary when the workers who they oversee decide to stop competing and start seeking out their destiny. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. If a person supports organizations which reflect communist teachings, or organizations labeled communist by the Department of Justice, she may be a communist. What is communism? It is our intent and our purpose to clear up the confusion and to tell the truth about communism. Now you might say, how does all this history of class war better explain communism? That is what I asked for. The answer is that communists have zero goals or aspirations other than whatever aids the working class's liberation. The communist party seeks to understand the common goals and fight for what the global proletariat want as a whole. Other working class parties also want these things, but they lack the deeper resolution communism brings. Our ideas and our principles aren't discovered or invented to promote some thinker's vision of the world and defend it. Instead, we have descriptions of actual events and choose to fight for people who must work all day to pay their rent. They sound like people who are talking about property rights. Freedom to own property.
property. Communists are not defined by property abolition. Ownership of property has changed with every class collision. The French Revolution gave the feudal land to merchants. Instead of transferred via weapons, it's now conquered with a purchase. The communists must now support a different distribution to appropriate all property from private institutions. But wait, complained detractors, do you want to take the things that people make with their own hands and all the freedom this right brings? Well, I ask you to provide me with examples of this right. Even craftsmen and small farmers barely own a thing in sight. The items average people truly owns a shrinking list. How could we destroy something that doesn't now exist? Or do you mean the property of business and investment? The power of this property to exploit is incessant. The owner of this property owns more than just a thing. They enjoy a social status that their capital can bring, which allows them to control a mass of workers as a team. And so this bourgeois property is more than what it seems. It isn't very private, but is social in its nature. And to give it to the people would just change it toward their favor. And what of wage labor? Have we not the right to work and be paid? Yes, of course, we'd never take that right away. The only real difference would be that instead of every man's work accumulating just to please some jerk, the accumulated labor and the profits or residual would widen and enrich the lives of every individual. And individuality itself will start to flourish when capital is gone and living humans can be nourished. What? Well, sign away my freedom? Why, this is ridiculous. Then they say we'll take away independence and freedom. That's true, but only from the bourgeoisie after we beat them. We'll take away their freedom to control all mass production. But to speak of this as freedom is a misleading construction. Their markets can be freer or they can be more restricted, but the communists would make it like both kinds never existed. When bourgeoisie object to taking property, their real objection is we take their property and thus their right to buy elections. If by liberty and freedom you mean this, then you shouldn't have the latter and the first should not exist. Communism doesn't try to stop you having stuff unless that stuff's a fact. In that case, yes, you own enough. But without this big incentive, why would anybody work? The vast majority of workers now don't get this perk. Another accusation is that we'd destroy the culture. These people think all culture is high class and there's no other. All that culture does for us is keep us in our roles. These bourgeois ideas, laws, and values serve their bourgeois goals. It's a selfish misconception that the current social norms are eternal laws of nature when they're only bourgeois forms. You see what's happening in our classrooms. You see the destruction of real education. You see the effort to say that parents have no say in education. Well, this is from the Communist Manifesto. This is from Marx. This is an intent to destroy the nuclear family. Then they say we'll take away the nuclear family. If parents can't afford to see their children now, how can we? We would protect the children from abuse if it exists, and we would add public education to the wanted list. Teaching students always comes with social implications. The only thing we'd take away is class indoctrination. They say the family will be ruined by public institutions while they force our children to pay bills with drugs and prostitution. They'll communalize our wives is another accusation. They'll take away the women and begin reallocation. This only makes sense if you think women are tools of production to be privatized or taken for our function. Actually, our only goal is liberating all women in sight. And if they wish to leave you, that's their right. They also say we want no nations, only open borders. The borders now barely exist and that's on bourgeois orders. All we'll do is give the nation to the common man. And if he wants to join with other nations, then he can. But because to win, the global workforce must unite. This outcome does seem likely and that would be all right. Communism is a complete opposite and enemy of any kind of nationalism. Its avowed program is to destroy totally the religions, governments, institutions, and traditions of the world of every religion and culture. I would rather see my little girls who die now still believing in God than have them grow up under communism and one day die no longer believing. Concerns that are religious or are based in ideologies needn't be addressed as they are self-contained tautologies. Is it really so incredibly hard to understand that when the ruling class's goals shift to other plans, values, and ideas that dominate are redefined, that they control discourse and thought that populates the people's mind? New ideas are not the cause of changes in society. They are as strong as is the class that favors their variety. When ancient kingdoms fell, the gods were switched for Jesus. And will all of gods from any nation if they beat us? But some things persevere, they say, like faith itself and higher truth with communism cause these things to end for good with nothing new? There are consistencies in history as well. There always was a class in charge, even 
and if others fell but if the proletariat will end all class oppression ideas will change so much that every truth will be in question but let's move on from criticism what is it we want to see we want the proletariat in charge of the economy for this the things they'll have to do may be hard to swallow every country is different but some basics are as follows nobody can own the land it's made for you and me a strong progressive income tax and no more usury abolish all inheritance and ban capital flight central banking postal mail and rails heavy and light the mines and farms and factories can be improved and used with massive armies working them with long-term plans issued city country inequality put in the past and children taken from the factories and put in class if workers gain control and they establish these conditions they'll have given everyone a say in national decisions and with this great democracy all class will disappear and freedom and prosperity will finally be here you the people have the power the power to create machines the power to create happiness you the people have the power to make this life free and beautiful to make this life a wonderful adventure then in the name of democracy let us use that power let us all unite I want to devote this program to going over with you the major ways this idea of socialism is understood. Because those ways are relevant today. Those ways are fighting it out amongst themselves in terms of the allegiance and feelings and thoughts of people around the world. And they're going to shape our future. So here's the first one. In 1830, in France and England, the aristocracies had begun to realize their time of rule was done and started critiquing and poking fun at the bourgeoisie, striking its heart's core, but claiming to write on behalf of the poor who saw through the joke that this pain was more than under exploitation of the feudal life before. And furthermore, their actual concern was that a class of people was created who may turn and make their world burn, so they hope for our defeat they trade away civility for mercantile treats. They also were joined by their Christian friends who made a type of socialism which depends on charity and poverty, monastic life and love, and give the Lord's legitimacy from the man above. God must have the means to house, clothe, and feed its members. The Lord will take care of all his children. No, I can't do that. But I believe that he can. The medieval burgesses and land-owning peasants became the petty bourgeoisie, but as their power lessens, they start to disappear and become workers like the rest. So French intellectuals wrote at their behest, exposing the hypocrisy of political economy, but reverting to a version of the past is what they want to see. They wanted corporate guilds and hierarchy on the farms, but they quickly fell apart and bourgeoisie were not alarmed. I accuse many of my fellow economists as uh, rearranging with great acumen, rearranging. It is a paradox that the notion of small, of intermediate technology would catch on with the enthusiasm that it has. The socialist and communist literature of France was handed off to Germany when the feudal bourgeois dance had just begun. Capital hadn't won, and so the practical significance of it was none. But philosophers interpreted it as practical reason and attempted to combine it with the things that they believed in. They took French ideas and just added on their own, and claimed that true socialism was this kind alone. They tried to generalize away from class, as if there's some platonic form of man who we can ask about his true goals. This approach was pretty useless until the bourgeoisie began to push their liberal movement. It could have fought both sides, but it forgot its class analysis and began running defense for despotic palaces. It also was useful to the German Philistines, those petty bourgeoisie hate bourgeoisie and worker fiends. They claimed to be typical men and used a socialist lens and slandered communism as a brutal offense. Labor's right. Management's right. I'm strictly neutral. There are members of the bourgeoisie who want to make improvements, but they don't enjoy the poor or any of their ugly movements. They wish that everyone could just join the bourgeoisie. They don't care, they're just scared, and they ask for unity. A more practical side of this movement attempted to promote some real-life changes to conditions that offended them. They say the following is true. Less regulation, more free trade, and we'll do it all for you. I believe you won't keep political freedom unless you also have economic freedom, which means that you must have a large part of free enterprise in your whole economy. Early proletarian revolutionaries were beguiled by universal equality and self-denial. 
They saw the class abuse, but they searched for universal social laws that they could use. They hoped future history would carry out their will. But it's a mystery how long they'll have to wait until that occurs. And they care about workers only as much as they are the class that most suffers. In terms of which class to support, they needn't make decisions. They hope they can convince everyone to see their vision. They reject revolution and they lead by example with impossible solutions that they're not equipped to handle. It's an early attempt to define some decent asks. Though utopian in nature, they attempt to dissolve class. But revolutionary ideas were distorted as time went on. They became reactionary, singing new religious songs. Here's the answer to your problems, Dr. Utopia's sensational loot discovery will cure any ailment of the body politic. It's terrific! The communists fight for the interest of the working class, but also for the movement as a whole. And for her to last in France, we side with social democrats, but remain critical. In Switzerland, we side with the party of the radicals. In Poland, we support the party that revolted just last year. And in Germany, with bourgeoisie, when they appear to fight against the monarchy, but instilling class awareness in the proletariat, so they will see the lack of fairness. Germany should be our focus, since it's on the verge of transformation and a growing revolutionary urge. And the communists support all revolution, and the question that they make the most important is a property possession. We support collaboration with all movements for democracy and openly declare our goals, no secrets or hypocrisy. We want a revolution, we don't care if it offends you. Let the ruling classes tremble at the communist agenda. Let workers of all countries unite with this refrain. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Workers of the world unite! Well, that, that seems like a logical idea.